I was uh, talking to this uh, tech support person uh, a week or two ago. She was like this. Uh, hello there, Bynes. Uh, how can I help you now? Sugar. It was like, and she was like super polite, and she's just like, I was like, what? I was like, I love your accent. I said, I said, or maybe I have an accent. I don't know, but <laughs> where are you from? She, said, well, I'm just right here in Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make that up. <laughs> that was beautiful. Beautiful, and with the excessive like politeness and like the That's listening awesome. and the it was awesome, and it just made me feel better about life. Hello, everybody. This is the uh, Crackcast. Crackcast number. 393, the Drunk Gut Quack cast. I'm Ozone Ocean, and with me is Tan Serene, sitting next to me. Hello. And Baines, who is a speaker. Hello, angels. <laughs> <laughs> Talking to us from uh, a few thousand kilometres away in uh, Canada. While Tan and I are in Greece, and uh, I think Pitt is locked up in a Dungeon Basement. somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> you can't. In a, a cat of nine tails. Or no, what's that thing called? An Iron game. Maiden. That's all, that's uh... <laughs> Locked up inside a cat of nine tails? That's rather surreal. <laughs> that would be kind of weird, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was wrong, but I, for some reason that's what came to mind. Oh, jeez. You know, that thing has got a fancy name. You've got your wrists yeah. in it, you've got your neck in it. The stockade? Is oh, is that what it is? So it does yes. have a fancy name. Yes. Or a pillory. Yeah. <laughs> I know all the devices. Um, yeah. Okay. So... Uh, just kidding. <laughs> and, now, and, now, <laughs> and now there's no uh, protective screen. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I will have to defend myself. <laughs> oh, you've got a giant bayonet, so you're fine. I do. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, we're going to be talking about um, uh, give it your best shot. Isn't that right, Baines? That is correct. Uh, it's a post about camera angles or sh- shots. Sh- 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 shots. 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 Um, shots. Yeah. <laughs> That's like a, the most pretentious uh, 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 accent that you can hear on a Greek uh, traditional movie film. Like they all, they all try to sort of pronounce everything as an A. Shots. Shots. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about. But first, we've got to get into the feature, and the feature this week is one sixth stories. So take it away with the feature. I was nation with the feature. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Ozone Ocean, and my feature for the week was One Sixth Stories. This story centers around a group of highly fashionable young ladies. They like to meet, compete, and compare their stylish looks with each other. But all that is about to change. Vicious animals are on the loose. Tigers, carnivorous giraffes, horses with tattoos... Whatever is the world coming to? Grab your shotgun and go after these vicious brutes. This is a hilarious satirical comic with snappy inspired writing and crazy situations. All art is done with photos of one six scale dolls and shown as single panels. So it makes for a relatively quick reading comic, despite the length. Yes, indeed, there are over a hundred pages here, but you quickly race through it because it's just so fun and there's only like one panel or maybe two panels on each page, so there's not much. Um, uh, Yeah, this is a comic with dolls in. We've seen a couple of uh, comics like that on the website. It's not too many. Um, Of course, Bravo1102, here's our... um, very famous for doing comics with uh, photos of uh, dolls. But yeah, this is another good one, and it's very enjoyable. You you never really think that you'll get into something like this, but it seems to be an up-and-coming genre. There's even a film about these kind of things anyway. So um, yeah, get into this and enjoy it and have an incredible laugh over this uh, crazy, crazy post-apocalyptic situation. 
with the uh, the, the invasion of the animals. So yes, uh, read one sixth stories by one sixth cents rated M. <laughs> And that was our feature. Okay, now for the featured music. Gum, this week, Gamolus has given us the featured theme to Salamander. This music blasts on like the plasma fury of a raging furnace, bathing your ears with vermilion heat. Hot and dry, heavy, distorted, layered guitar and rocky drums create the feeling and the image. This is a hot, hot sound. So take it away, Gum Wallace, with Salamander. <laughs> music from gum wallace thank you for that gum wallace okay so let's chat about wide shots and close-up shots and medium shots and shots in the dark and <laughs> and, and shots of vodka yes exactly <laughs> <laughs> a lot of vodka shots um all right so yeah. how did Shot you come up <laughs> I heard that in a long time. That's awesome. Oh, good. And shot through the heart? Oh, they... And you're to blame. You give love. Right? Yeah. Not bad. No. Name. Now I have yeah. a bang, bang, she shot me down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is not going um, the way that it was intended. <laughs> <laughs> We're all shot to hell. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the idea that, you know, just like a movie, obviously, you, we all know this, you guys know this, you know, mm-hmm. you have different camera angles. The default, I think, especially for a, like, a, a beginning artist or someone doing a gag strip or whatever, is to do the static shot, like the maybe the proscenium or whatever they call it, where it's just like a straight view, a medium shot, like a three-quarter view of your character just talking. So this okay. is just the idea that, you know, just like in a movie, like, of course, a comic can have all different, you can move your camera anywhere you want, you know, and the basics would break down, I, I guess, in a way to these three or four huh. or maybe five shots of your wide <laughs> shot, medium and your close up, maybe your extreme wide shot, maybe your extreme close up, you could throw in there. Okay. And uh, sort of like when when to use them and and just to think about using them. I mean, I definitely stick to the close up medium shot a lot. Yeah, so I'm not thinking I'm... about it. I'm just yeah. I just think most of them. most of us would because that's usually how you watch people. Like you don't watch them from afar. Even if right. you are, if even if you are the, the creepo that will use a binocular, you do that to bring uh, everyone in that actual shot, like close, yeah. middle close. <laughs> so uh, that's True. that's how you watch people in general. So for a certain genre, it's uh, it's pretty appropriate. I mean, and you wouldn't want to go crazy with you know sort of strange, extreme close-ups, wide shots, weirdly changing angles. If it's if it doesn't fit the scene, if it doesn't fit the tone of the 
story or the genre of story you're doing you know it would just be it's just distracting you know when you don't know where you are you don't know what you're looking at yeah I, i've seen movies that do that you know they don't they just sort of break the rules and it goes too far it takes you out yeah a certain um styles of things obviously will have more of one style of um shots than others so i was thinking of say your um uh, typical strange that will have more of those medium shots, won't it? Or because it's a for comedy, for sure, yeah. So and close ups mixed in, you know, you have single character, yeah. just the head. Because there's a focus on that that the characters rather than the scenery, most of the time, and character Very interaction. So. And in order for yeah. the the audience to relate to the characters, you need those kind of shots. Whereas, say, in a more dramatic um, comic you know, where place is involved more than just the people, then you have to have the wider shots and establishing when you change locations and things like that. Or depicting action things, that's when you have to be more experimental, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on what you really want the audience to pay attention to. The the level of, uh, like, what shot you're going to use is, in a sense... How much you want to force your audience to pay attention to something? Yeah. And uh, look exactly where you want them to look. Whereas when you don't want that, you will use wider shots um, where it's up to them where their attention is. So you may not notice certain little details in the background that perhaps uh, later if you go back, you will. And, uh, oh, you, you will realize that, okay, that was in the panel, but I didn't see it. <laughs> so. Mm-hmm. I noticed, uh, say in Pinky TA, uh, oh, sorry, I have a, a lot of scenes that take place in sort of massive um, environments. So I have giant uh, mecha and things like that and, you know, huge snowscapes. And so I really need to, to be able to show that to the audience to to give them that sense of place and the scale so you need like bird's eye views um worm's eye views to show how big things are um Mm. wide shots where we've just got you know trying to make people realize that there's quite a panorama here to focus on so that's something i have to do with pinky ta more than anything else and i notice like when i do bottomless waitress it's completely the opposite. I'm focusing on characters and people. Mm-hmm. So eye level kind of shots, two people in a panel, three people in a panel, but, you know, not doing bird's eye sh- views, not doing mm-hmm. um, worm's eye, um, not doing very many close-ups because it's just not needed and that would distract. So, you know, you could... you could Bum's force... eye views. Yes, <laughs> bum's eye views. <laughs> you, you can force drama by going, you know, having a simple little interaction and then showing, um, you know, a view from the floor or a view from the ceiling. Mm-hmm. And people do that for comic effect, like in, in some manga and things like that. Also for a dramatic effect. Yeah. But that would be, that would harm the reading of this particular style mm-hmm. of, of comic that, that we Baines and I are doing. That would not work. That's, uh, just because yeah. it's, it, it feels a lot like... Uh, uh, 1970s or 80s sitcom, but with totally. bats. Yes, it is. <laughs> That's actually literally what it is. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh. yeah. I feel so good now about myself. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. how it started out. We had the. Uh... It's Alice without pants. <laughs> <laughs> Alice doesn't live here anymore. <laughs> yeah. I actually watched that. The... Wasn't there a movie that that sitcom was based around, I think? Yeah, I haven't seen it, but I remember the sitcom when I was a little kid. Yeah, I actually went and watched that. I'm just trying to do a Craig at the moment. I'm drawing him. He's doing his uh, mop routine. (laughs) (laughs) I've got him leaning on a mop. This would be the perfect um, uh, time for him to break into a song and do the whole dance routine with his mop. And he could be pretending. Tap dancing with his mop. He'd be if we ever make a movie, and... definitely. Yeah. <laughs> It'll definitely be a musical. 
the I Want song that all Disney things used to have. <laughs> 100%. So, yeah, so in, bo- uh, not bottomless voyages, in typical strange, typically you you have this, um, your repertoire of shots. Do you do close-up shots very much? Well, a close-up would just be on a, a character's uh, head, maybe head and shoulders, would you say? Okay. So, yeah, not extreme close-up on the eyeballs like Tance has got in her uh, latest page. It's right, a, maybe I'm wrong in my terminology. I could be. I could no, be no, that that is a close up. Considered. It is. It yeah. is a close up. Yeah. It's like yeah, um, extreme close up is a lot rarer. You get that in Sergio Leone films and things like this, which I love. You know, <laughs> right okay. up on the eyes. So, yes, just on the <laughs> sweat eyes. running down the side That's of the awesome. nose. Yeah, and but, then he also has those super wide, you know, those wide shots. Ah, oh, the guy was a master. Yeah. Beautiful. That's that sense of distance and that scale you know, in general. It's, it's very striking. I'm like Breaking Bad, that show mm-hmm. Breaking Bad uh, uses that a lot. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Big influence on me, Sergio Leone. Big influence on Pinky TA in my yeah. paneling and where I do uh, views and things. But yeah. but yeah, so the the extreme close up. So that's not really a feature of Typical Strange because you don't. If you did that, it'd be really for comic effect, you know, like zooming in on yes. someone's eyes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> showing panic. Yeah, for sure. Because I've probably done it, but rarely. Yeah. I, w- I definitely mm-hmm. stick to the medium shot and close up. Yeah, zooming on. Uh, I was someone. just flipping through some pages, and it's almost all like it's just that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. I I tend to, well, not tend to, but there are occasions where I will zoom in on the eyes a lot uh, because it the eyes will often give a lot of information about how the characters are feeling about things and, and how much they are willing to show these emotions um, so right. for example there was this this scene where the one Gary Lassell is meeting this other Gary Lassell and they don't really like each other because, you know, one is communist, the other is towards a royalist. And now they have to work together, so they don't much like each other. So the idea to show this is by having the leaders or the representatives, let's say, um, just glare at each other and to focus this, to, to draw attention to this. So I will I will use, and I did use, like small little panels, one under the other, where they had an extreme close-up of the eyes, just, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, doing this whole I'm watching you routine, <laughs> sort of thing. Right. Uh, and I, I, yeah, I'm also watching you, that sort of thing. <laughs> like this. Yes, <laughs> exactly, that thing. Um, so, because otherwise, I, and, and but that was before the establishing shot where you know everyone is in in a room, very much mm-hmm. like the one I am with uh, Oz uh, right now. Uh, that has a long table, and you know they're all around the table. So you have on one end of the table the one guy, and on the other end the other guy, and they're yeah. sort of leaning in, into each other and glaring. So you know that they are glaring, but I want to put extra stress. So after you know where they are looking at, I show you their eyes, and and they really aren't, you know, friendly to each other. They, right. They are forced to be there in a sense. Okay, so that's another yeah. use of uh, close-ups. You can, mm-hmm. you can really get emotion in the eyes and the looks. Yeah, that that can be good. Yeah, because it's hard to really show eye emotion in small you know panel size if you've just got faces exactly the eyes you can get a sort of a broad look but the closer in you can Mm -hmm. get you can show more detail because the lines can be thinner and everything like that that's interesting i hadn't really thought of um using that as an as an emotive kind of thing normally i do that to um to force the audience to look at the character's eyes and to have them just focus on the fact that uh the character is looking somewhere 
rather than actually showing emotion. Mm-hmm. I'm not really that great yeah. at showing emotion. I'm getting better through doing Bottomless Waitress. That's teaching me to focus mm-hmm. more on expressions and things, which I actually love doing. But, yeah, it's um, you you can only do that in certain kinds of uh, panels, can't you? Yeah. Like, you want them to be, like, little shots here and there, like small information that the eye of the reader is going to take in while they are moving through the page. So, yeah. and I think that depending on how big your special uh, close-up or or something a shot is in the in the whole uh, layout, it's uh, how also how important you want the audience to feel that it is. Like yeah, in this yeah. page that uh, it's uh, it's not the page that is going to go up on uh, Monday. It's the page after that that uh, the patrons are going to see. Plug. Um, so uh, in that page, uh, I have a, a relatively large, extreme shot uh, panel of uh, Fotis's eyes, where he is relatively pissed off and uh, looking at someone who is calling him. And the the important thing isn't that he's looking towards that person. The important thing is on two levels. Uh, one is to show his general countenance, which is going to be his resting face. Like <laughs> he's going to have a little bit of a, a you know, resting bitch face for a while. Um, and and there's that. So you have to see. So you see that he generally has aggression that is going. It, it's sort of behind his eyes in a sense. I hope at least it gets across that way. But the other thing that I also want to see. Uh, want to show to my audience is the level of damage that he has suffered and that's not something I can easily show in his normal like in uh, normal shots and uh, the reason for that is that it's very schematic it's going to be like you know three lines going through one goes through the eye and everything but you don't really see the the level of damage that he, that he has suffered. So now I want you, as an audience, to see it just this one time because it's not gonna be shown again. So it it brings in the the it it lets it lets the whole thing sink in that this is permanent and he's gonna be living with this now and he also has this aggression that is linked to that. So. At one panel is there to message to get across that. Yeah, it's very important that kind of thing, isn't yeah. it? Because yeah, comics are a half visual, half text. Mm-hmm. Well, in various real, uh, various uh, combinations, anyway. Um, so roughly that, and so, yeah, the visual aspect is very important for delivering that information. But you don't want to, you know constantly reiterate that over and over and over you just want to give that mm-hmm. and that's that's what the audience gets and they have to get that information in the most efficient way possible from that uh, mm-hmm. or striking or entertaining way possible it just depends yeah well if it's a drama you want to have it striking yeah if it's for you know like in uh, for a, for like a comedy probably you want more entertaining and striking, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. What do you guys think of this panel here? I'll see if I can show it to you after I save. We're just showing off that we can sketch <laughs> <laughs> while we're in this arrangement. This is um, this is a picture of uh, let's see, can you see that, Baines? Yeah. His face is a bit distorted there, but so so that was Pit Face's idea to show him uh, with a dreamy kind of expression. Yeah, that's face good. Love actually. Heart. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to yeah uh, get it across. Was, it his, was great. Yeah. His dreaminess. Actually, I was just thinking now, um, as an aside, thinking I should have based him on Fotis. Oh my so. god, <laughs> that would have been awesome, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because, you know, if, if it were an other circumstances, if he wasn't put through the ringer and everything, he would totally be this semi-goofy, semi-rascally sort of 
fellow that would be totally daydreaming and uh, exactly you know being to girls and sort of uh, wafting towards them like Garfield or something <laughs> so after yeah. the lasagna well he does sort of have a bit of the look sort of yeah could be made into that you yeah. have to lose the the nose though it has to be quite, <laughs> like goes like this for photos oh he has a bit of a ski jump nose yeah just a bit just a bit oh what Same. was that is that pit face trying to get on on the call that could be pit face if my slow computer will Oh, I think it is, yeah. Okay, yay. Come on in, Pitsy. Pitsy Bitsy. I think the way you actually do this face is very close to Fosses. It is, because I was <laughs> I was actually thinking of that. <laughs> that is... That but is I did give him a different nose, though. So it's not Fosses, but it's very close. Man, that looks so much like Fosses there. It does. I couldn't help myself. No scars. No scars. And and that's another thing. Like I wanted him to to have a face that you could tell that if he wasn't, you know, scarred or whatever, he would actually be easy on the eyes. Rather oh, than right, yeah. Rather than uh, you know, a little bit in rough and intimidating or even, you know Yeah. Not easy on the eyes. <laughs> Depending on who is looking. Um, so. Oh, so is, uh, is Pit coming in? We're gonna lure her in. Drink. Lure her in. Wave some uh, something around that she likes beer or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so in, in that particular panel that I was talking about, uh, getting back to that, that is. How would you describe that kind of panel, Bent? Oh, you can't see it on the camera. He can, he can. Just yeah. we can't. No, okay, now we can also see it. What is that? Is that just a close-up, I think? At, just at eye level, isn't it? It's a simple, straight... Uh, yeah, it would be a close-up, right? Yeah. It's a yeah. close-up. Yeah. And, and see, immediately it gives information about how he's feeling and, you know, mm. the state, the, the, the head space in his hands. Exactly. And yeah, it, yeah. That's what a close up is really. I mean, first thing that comes to mind. Yeah, is that showing emotion. As you, you get a chance just to do. Um, you can so easily do emotion because the face fills the the panel almost. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and the face is the whole point. Yeah, the, you make the yeah. audience focus on the face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have any text with that kind of thing. I mean, especially when there's no text. Yeah, they focus in. Or, exactly. or it might very much uh, give tone to the text. Yeah, like exactly. a, a very yeah, simple phrase could have absolutely different tone with the right close-up. Yeah. Yeah, it's the most powerful part of the mm -hmm. uh, whatever is being said or whatever the... Uh... I think I will transform him into yeah. Fotis. Change his nose a little. <laughs> I was going when I... Okay, I'm going on on the side here. I won't. I won't. But uh, yeah, so you you can lend a, um, the tone to the uh, the dialogue with the way you do the artwork, which is the whole point of doing artwork. I <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Like if the dramatic punch, for example, uh, or the big revelation, or whatever is important in the dialogue, or, or like you said, a certain emotion to that part, you go to a new panel with a close up and have that part of the dialogue there rather mm -hmm. than stuffing it all into the medium or wide shot exactly and that's what i think about a lot when i that's why i love your particular news post on this because i really do think about like close-ups and um wide sh medium shots wide shots you know those kind of things all the time when i'm working because i say in pinky ta i i really have to sort of jump around because I you've got so much to show and you really could never do that efficiently in a um just showing you know medium shots all the time so yeah. you have to change things 
and that took yeah a- well i remember in particular like your bird's eye you were talking about it earlier like your bird's eye view wide shots where you come way up and you see mm-hmm. that you're on this um, tundra or plane or whatever yeah and you're it- way above looking at the mecca like it's just uh, mm-hmm. the very striking oh you thank you to get that sense of scale yeah, you really do need it because say I'm showing like um the these mecha doing exercises or whatever. So I but I have to show like um the stands where all the people are watching from. I have to show the mecha over here, this machine over here, and I have to give give the audience like an idea of where these things are placed in space. The only right. way to really do that is to do that kind of almost like a map shot. Yeah. Which you can't do from um ground level mm-hmm. so yeah you yeah. have to you you're forced to do all this kind of stuff or say there was a t- page where i've got everybody working on the mecca madly in this um uh, workshop i so, remember that one that was... yeah. the easiest wow. way to do that was to show um, a bird's eye view that's what i was thinking of anyway that way you can show okay people working down here people working up there people working down here and you can have everything in there and show the scale of the place. You can show the scale of the work all in one shot. So it's the most efficient way of doing it rather than trying to depict that in a series of... The other way to do it would be a montage. So mm-hmm. you do a series of shots of different kinds of work, which would take way longer to do, even though it's, it can be very hard to do um, a bird's eye view or you know a very high level looking down view and have a lot of things going on that's a lot easier than coming up with a whole lots of different sketches mm-hmm. of people working on different things which yeah. i've done before as well and that's just it's, pain it's also a, it gives a different uh, feeling to the audience because if you have this one like like a splash page of uh, everything that's happening the the reader will stop and you know look at all the people where yeah. they are working or whatever, and it gives a feeling of okay, now this is huge, this is large scale, and everything. Whereas, if you have the small, smaller uh, panels one after the other, it gives more of a sense of speed in a sense. Yeah, like, that is uh, true. They're you going the rhythm. through faster, like uh, it, it depends really on where you want to. to uh, place the focus more is it uh, the scale or is it the speed yeah. or is it both a little bit so that's a good point because a montage say in film or whatever rushes you through a scene that speeds you through a lot of things that are happening doesn't it and that works the same way in a comic you compress everything in a montage yeah whereas you can show the same level of things happening in a splash panel, but slow people down. Isn't that ironic? Exactly. So, yeah, in this page of Bottomless Waitress. <laughs> in this page of Bottomless Waitress, mostly I have what, medium shots and close-ups. What would you say that is, Baines, there? Uh, can you hold it higher? Which panel? Uh, so the one with Francis on the top. The one with the butt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the first panel? Yeah. Yeah, I'd call that, um, I guess it's somewhere between a medium and a wide, since okay. you're seeing the whole body. Yeah, seeing the whole um, butt. That's what I would say. <laughs> yeah, you're seeing the whole butt. I mean, it's more or less, a, I guess it's more or less a medium shot, isn't it? Yeah. It's a pull back a little farther because you know you got to see <laughs> the moon. You have to see the, the whole moon. point of the comic. <laughs> I saw the whole of the moon. Oh, I love that song. <laughs> no, it has new meaning to me. <laughs> yeah, afterwards you, know, you can't you can't hear the same song in the same manner ever again. Oh, <laughs> oh like, But um, I would also like to talk about when the, the moon hits your eye. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. Like a big pizza pie. Song, right? Oh my god. Oh no. You get oh. pink eye. 
Oh. <laughs> I hear By you. the light <laughs> of the silvery. <laughs> I hate you guys. I hate you. Like these are my these are my songs that I get into the mood for feeling nice. <laughs> well, it's a marvelous night for a moon dance. <laughs> stop you! Someone stop you! Oh jeez! Uh, what were you? You were saying something. I was gonna talk about uh, the shot where you have the lower, the worm's eye view. Oh right, yeah, worm's eye views. So you talked about how it can give a sense of a uh, scale, the large scale, mm. but in drama, it can also give a sense of threat. And and also give you even an idea of how one of the characters is perceiving the environment, which uh, might give uh, an an insight into the character's uh, sense of panic or vulnerability or things like that. And yeah. I'm thinking about um, this scene. Theoretically, is a spoiler, but. It's been long enough, so I don't care. Um, there, there is this scene where Diomedes goes and finds Stelios, who is another kid that did something wrong, and he kills him. <laughs> so um, the whole sequence starts with the middle shots, and then when uh, the confrontation happens, um, there is this uh, sort of an establishing shot of where the the crime is taking place, and then the you show you I show <laughs> you don't <laughs> I saw I saw how uh, Diomedes throws the other kid down, and the very next panel is a worm's eye view of Diomedes holding the he has like a a chair leg that he uses to bludgeon the other kid to death. Wow. So um, so it's this shot of Diomedes looming over the kid with the with the with a stick in his yeah. hand. And yeah. you know, threatening saying like you did this to us and you did that to us. And, you know, now it's payday. Um, so the idea is that the kid is that is being threatened, he is afraid by Diomedes, in a sense. And, but also that Diomedes is stepping out of his own shell, in a sense, and doing something much larger than what he is. So you can take it both ways, and I hope that it adds to the drama, the way that's around. Yes, and with the bird's eye view, yeah, you show threat, intimidation, the worms all that eye. kind of thing. Yeah. With that worm's eye view, yeah, you're right. That can, because you're making the audience feel small, so the audience are the ones who are looking up. Mm -hmm. They're being forced into that that low angle view. So, yeah, that's who you're, you're manipulating the viewpoint of, not really the characters, mm -hmm. because yeah, the audience are the ones who are Yeah, looking. absolutely. Uh, but um, why I talked about the character is that if the character has been shown to be on that level and then you use that angle, mm. it also coincides with the character's idea. Yeah. So it's not only you, you, are forced, you are forcing the audience to see things through that particular character mm. for a second. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The worm. Yes. So to speak. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, be the worm. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. I, I have not done that too many times, right? though I have done that sometimes, especially with the, in Pinky TA, um, when I wanted to show the characters being a bit more um, threatening or I wanted to show the situation being a bit more uh, dark or intimidating. I'd show, I'd give a bit of a low angle view of, say, Pinky. Oh, I did that, I remember now, I did that quite a while ago in one of the really early panels of Pinky TA. I've got this, um, this image where she's walking along a corridor 
and it's a <laughs> really low angle view of her, so you can see her boots are really big, and you're sort of mm. looking up at her as she's going through this corridor. And the corridor is like fire stained. There's stains on the walls, and there's a there's a dead body on the ground. You see a skeleton, burnt out face on that that worm's eye view and then Pinky looming above it as she walks through. So the view gives a sense of unease and um, that, uh, yeah, just unease. And I think it worked quite well doing that, doing that way. And mm-hmm. it was a lot of fun as well. That's another thing we haven't really talked about. Views can be, it can be very boring when you're drawing things from a certain view. Not not for the audience, but you as as a creator, you can get sort of bored with what you're drawing. And could, could even be for the audience, audience too. Well. Yeah. yeah, it could be. But from a creator's point of view, you think, I really am bored at doing this. I need to shake this up. I need to, um, to try a different angle just for the fun of it. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, so I can get a better view of this world, but also it's, it's a a change from doing the same old, same old. So yeah. mm-hmm. that's why you can do it. Some, that's why I do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wish I could be this impulsive. Like I always have to orchestrate everything. Okay. I have to know. No, I don't have to know. I have to know why I'm doing something. I might get the inspiration as I'm making the page. And then I, which is, I hate when that happens because usually I have made a panel and I don't like it and I scrap it. <laughs> and I have to make it again from a completely di- different angle. But I have to know why I'm doing it. Mm. Even though uh, people... Uh, even though people... Oh my, I lost my train of thought, sorry. You have to scrap your panels because you're, yeah. you're orchestrating. Oh yeah, I- even if it... If uh, uh, audiences don't actually get across what I'm intending, I still have to know why I'm doing it the way I'm doing it. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, the way I do my page, the way I design my panels and pages is I read like the outline that I have for the page or the script in terms of bottomless features where Baines has written out all the whole script, and I come up with a bunch of pan- just rough sketches of the panels that are I think are going to express this story or this dialogue in the best way and you know often I'll I'll come up with maybe two or three different sketches for the same panel and I'll think okay that's an okay that's a straight the most straightforward simplest angle you can have that's what I start with because that's the easiest way to think in terms of then I think no that's not really that interesting maybe I'll look at that from a different view or maybe I'll look at that from yeah uh different angle and that kind of thing and then you know I'll sort of decide on and often I'm really stupid and I'll think I like all those views I'm going to incorporate every single one of them into the page <laughs> often um, the way I I sort of see it as a as a movie scene in my head first like how would I want to watch it on the screen okay and then I try to simulate it as much as possible so, yeah. We could we would would be fantastic storyboarders, I think. I think so. Except I think Pinky Tear would be too expensive because I'd be changing angles every single time. Well, <laughs> most of Pinky would be three D models, though. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, there's never going to be a Pinky Tear movie. Too much CGI. <laughs> CGI is something that has allowed people to be more experimental with uh, um, angles and all that kind of thing. But, um, and that can be, you can get a lot of fatigue from that actually. Do you find that when people change angles and they're really creative with, um, creative in uh, air quotes there, when, they're too cre- when you're too creative with panels, you can get fatigue, can't you, as a viewer, as an audience? Well, for sure. I found that in, say, um, so if you're looking at, say, Silver Age or Golden Age comics, right, they're a lot more simple in the way they depict scenes and characters talking. And then later on when, you know, things got a bit more advanced, like in the 60s and 70s, maybe, yeah, around then, 
then you've got way more dynamic angles and um, you know these kind of fisheye views almost close up of someone's fist as they're punching and all that kind of thing and yeah that I think would that be the Jack Kirby uh, yeah that kind of thing that dramatic which it, it can be that can be um, show a lot of energy and dynamism uh, really really well, but it can also be fat- fatiguing as uh, you know for a reader to constantly be switching up between all these sort of angles and um, views like that. Do you find or maybe I mean I, I would think you might be right, but I, I would think it's it's more a matter of like if you're changing angles too much and you lose your sense of place, Mm. we were kind of talking about this already. Like if you're switching all over and you can't really tell what's as a viewer, what's going on. This is in a movie or in a comic, you know, like there's sort of the early nineties or or whatever, like this trend of these crazy looking panel layouts Mm. where it's like, it makes no sense, you know, that that's fatiguing, but I think it's just because it takes you out of the story and you don't know, what's going on you don't know what you're supposed to be focusing on or what you're supposed to care about exactly like a michael bay movie the all the uh quick uh, some of them yeah like with the quick cuts and with, with the uh like the overly dramatic shots which are great in their place but if you're all if everything is that shot it's like <laughs> how are you, how's it going to stand out you know yeah i was just watch i just rewatched the dark knight after a long time 10 year anniversary of that wow. so I was like, I've got to watch it before the year's over or we'll take my uh, my, my comic geek uh, <laughs> card away badge <laughs> your yeah. badge They'll revoke and it. it's got that uh, yeah take my badge away I'll, I'll just be stuck with my kiss army uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh they have that Michael Bay shot that swoop Tans, you watch every frame of painting he, he has that guy has a video on the Michael Bay shot yeah yeah and, uh, very interesting like everything that goes into it and making that shot work it's a cool shot that sort of swoop around and there is a a similar shot to that in the dark knight the joker after the you know the the truck he's in like batman takes it out and flips upside down the joker falls out so you have the joker with his gun you know on on foot and batman coming at him with the the bat cycle or whatever like that swoop (laughs) around the joker and yeah. it's awesome. It's so epic. It's like an amazing moment. You're just on the edge of your seat, you know. It's like it's where you do it. Um, and uh, you know, if every shot was that swoop, you know, of course. Yeah. Like, well, then you that's so, that's actually something that does happen. I was just thinking um in your uh your kung fu movies, they started the trend of um the exciting shots, the really exciting angles. And, you know, back in the Matrix days, mm. Matrix was the first Western movie to really um, to do the kung fu thing as well. And then everybody started doing it. And you no longer are those things any very special because they had it way too much, mm. way too many mm. of those views rather than having them stand out. And it depends, like, sometimes the one thing I really loathe in movies and uh, and also sometimes live shows is that they tend to cut away from the action for close-up shots or establishing shots when the the one thing that we want to do as an audience is to see the action without being interrupted so like a take for example uh, the fight scenes from taken uh, Taken 3, Taken... I don't know, so, so one of the Taken movies, which is terrible because you can't understand how they are, you know, fighting, how, how they how they are beating each other. <laughs> you just see right. fists and, and twisted faces like that, you know, gnarly, snarling faces <laughs> and stuff, which is fine, right. <laughs> but not when, not when you are trying to understand how how they are actually fighting, which is yeah. choreography. And I want to uh, see him using that special set of skills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the the absolute worst worst is when uh, you watch live uh, dance shows or 
you know, performance shows, whatever that is, and they will close up to the face while the person is dancing, and you want to yes. throttle, <laughs> you want to throttle that idiotic, uh, quote yeah. unquote, director who is sort, of, he's blinding you, yeah. and. It Don't becomes it becomes meaningless. Yeah, that is a good point. You have to know when to use certain views, and that is certainly a place not to use close-ups. Um, in uh, yeah, fights as well. It's like we were saying, um, choreography. Obviously, they do that in in uh, film because you can't really do a fight, so you have to um, do it from angles where it looks like punches are connecting or swords are cutting through people whereas and of course they're not really doing that you just have to you do angles to, sh to try and up the energy to uh, communicate to that to the audience without actually having it but there are ways of doing that without you know camera trickery we've, we've had uh, films of fight scenes since the 1910s mm -hmm. or before which have been very effective and no one's been killed on screen to produce them, so you don't have to <laughs> That's show. That's you know of. <laughs> but you don't have to cut away. You don't have to show this uh, this kind of, you know, 10-second flicking shots. It doesn't make it more effective. No. And it also doesn't help even your... In, I think that uh, to a very big extent they do it because for whatever reason the actors can't carry uh, the, the action as they should, <laughs> but you are still not actually protecting them that way because it 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 shows that the actor isn't actually fighting and you just put him in positions and then you all, you know, you sew it together like a Frankenstein's monster in a sense. <laughs> so it, it will work just as well, I suppose. <laughs> so. Well... You know, um, speaking of that, I was watching an old episode of The Mythbusters, hmm. which is, um, yeah, uh, an enjoyable kind of thing. And, it's, you know, so that's that's a more rea reality-based uh, sort of show without a heavy focus on narrative, although, you know, you always have a focus on narrative. So they're showing people were doing a recreation of the, um, the scene in Star Wars Return of the Jedi, where you have the uh, the Ewoks smash a an ATST, which is the, the chicken mm. leg walk up. So they've got the two um, huge uh, tree trunks that smash into either side of the thing. Okay, so they set that up and uh, they're showing these things smashing into an armored car. Unfortunately, what they these idiot directors with the the cameras they um, did it linearly. So what I mean is all the shots of these trees from all the different angles showing them swinging into this armoured car, they're cutting between them all, but in a, in a linear fashion. So as the trees are moving to it, you're going through different cameras, and then when, when it, the trees actually smash the armoured car, you see a close-up of the inside of the thing. So you don't actually see the trees Oh, anything. my God. That, that, oh my that's God. like a... I can't say that uh, on air, but, but it ends in tears, in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. But And the problem is, traditionally what you would have done is show the shots in parallel. So you show the same action from different cameras as the event happens, not, you know, so you show the trees swinging and hitting and smashing, so you get the whole thing. You get the money yeah. shot, you know, and you get that from a lot of different angles which is satisfying. You don't show it as if, you know, you, you're some uh, omnipresent being seeing this thing through all these uh, different eyes at the same time, but only, you know, as it's happening. That way you don't, you're not getting to see the same event. Um, I'm having real trouble trying to explain it, but, you know, um, you... Okay, so in the parallel way, which I'm describing, you show everything happening from the different angles in this uh, linear way you're showing okay step one from this angle step two from that angle step three from that angle rather than as one two three from each angle which mm -hmm. would be the the obvious way to do it on a show like Mythbusters 
where you're, you know, you're wanting to deliver information about the scene, not a, you know, not purely narrative. Right. That's yeah. So certain views and certain ways of showing things are more appropriate to different styles of communication, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah, to different, uh, yeah, different Yeah, and, and uh, you're trying to get across. You know, if uh, if uh, Pete Pace was here, she would say that uh, you have to consider what you need to convey and so and then dress it up. You know. Yeah, I've heard her say that. <laughs> <laughs> she says that all the time. Yeah. She's always saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Tant, it's like you're speaking. It's like she's speaking through you. Yeah, it's uh, we we have a connection, and and I can channel her <laughs> often. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, it's important to to realize what you're trying to show. Um, in Pinky TA, um, well, in Bottom Sway, just whatever. When I'm sort of coming up with a whole lot, lot of different angles and stuff like that. I come up with them uh, with limits, I would say. I don't just do any old angle I think is going to be interesting. I do a whole bunch of different angles of a shot, but I don't go absolutely crazy with them. You know, I'm not doing the worm's eye version mm-hmm. and you know, super zoomed out. But now this is giving me ideas that I mm. maybe I should. Like I'm, I'm thinking like I should like zoom out of the whole restaurant show it from a distance and just say the word bubbles come out (laughs) now make it like make it like a roller coaster like uh, first you zoom in very 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 much and then you zoom out very very much (laughs) (laughs) uh, until you give your audience a vertigo (laughs) (laughs) make them ill (laughs) oh god (coughs) but that's a damn good idea to show that you know okay establishing shots this is the kind of thing you have in the Mm -hmm. start of a panel or the start of a scene to yeah. give people the idea of where your things are in space. Mm-hmm. Do you guys often do establishing shots? Not often. Yeah. <laughs> we can okay. avoid it. Yeah, okay. Uh, at the beginning of a scene, you need you need to do it, um, especially, especially if, like, for my comic, I want people to know, to be able to recognize if they ever find themselves in Athens. That, oh, okay, this is where the thing happened. So the the beginning, the beginning of a sequence, I will have an establishing shot showing the place. Okay, this is where we are. Um, and then I will hope that everyone remembers because I don't do another one for a while. <laughs> so there's that. Ah. Yeah, that is really valuable in a reality-based comic like uh, Without Moonlight because it really does give you a sense of place. Mm. And you need that. The more something is set in a space, the more you need to do that. You really do. Um, I probably don't do that enough, really, with, uh, with Bottomless Waitress, although it's mainly set in the diner. But do you really need to? That's the thing. Yeah. It's a diner. They are going up and down the same corridor. You know, it's really weird in the diner because I hate drawing interiors. I really mm-hmm. do. And it's all set in interiors. So I draw yeah. that as little as possible. That's why I like to do a lot of close-ups on faces. So then I don't have uh, a reason to do anything else. Mm-hmm. So then you can um, just ignore the background details because if I do do any background details then my brain goes into autistic mode and wants to draw everything despite what my hands want to do you know mm-hmm. despite what the other side of my brain wants it just doesn't want, want to do that work but I'm compelled to do the work and right. to show everything the legs of the tables and the, the reflection of the light on the cushions on the chair <laughs> <laughs> I do that. So yeah, is that is that another the reason for doing close ups and things? Do you think to uh, be able to focus on doing drawing less detail? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. But it, but the scene has to be able to carry that. You know, so you don't do if you 
do close-ups all the time and there is no reason for doing them it might look like you know everyone knows what you're doing <laughs> like you just don't want to draw anything else oh, uh, right. yeah, in yeah. the sense that uh, yeah it might take away the flavor yeah okay. yeah that's true because like we're saying with establishing shots so you're setting a place you're yeah in your setting your thing in in a place and time and if you're focused too much on your headshots and things then you lose that um that sense of place and time mm -hmm. <laughs> people no longer or they can forget about it they can get confused because it's just all faces so yeah you don't want to um overload people on that kind of thing mm -hmm. depending on the work that you're doing it, again yeah it, it really depends like for example I have a I'm I'm uh, getting close to where there would be more typical action again, um, which is going to be a nice change of pace. But up until then, I have lots of people just uh, talking to each other in rooms, basically, which is important. I can't cut any of those scenes because they are setting up everything. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, I do need to focus on the people because they are the most dramatic thing in it. The room is just a, a bare bones room, so there's nothing in there that will be visually interesting except the people. So, right. oh, wow. this is giving me a lot of interesting ideas. I because doing a, uh, a comic is very much like doing a film in a lot of ways. Because mm -hmm. you, you focus on the visuals so much. So even in that kind of scene, you could have like a painting on the wall or a teapot. Mm -hmm. And a lot of scenes could be on those. Like on what's happening on the table. Sorry guys, but I have to take this. Like Sorry. a glass of wine or something like that. So you could have like a conversation between two people. And there's an ashtray on the table and a, a glass of wine and you're all almost having no focus on the people except their hands and the glasses of wine. In each panel, the, the glasses of wine could be, you know, uh, with less wine in them and there could be more cigarettes yeah. and more ash in the ashtray. Yep. And that shows your progression of time and you can show drama through that. Just simple right. shots. As of someone looking down on that, you know, just a normal eye view on the table. So there are so many ways of uh, of expressing, you know, uh, temporality oh, yeah. and drama and things just through your shots and what you choose to focus on. Yeah. Without. But I mean, there's a whole idea of um, I've talked about that book, Framed Ink, before, and it, it talks yeah. a lot about like how you express character. And relationships based on like how, how the characters are situated in the angle, what's between them or not between them. Like if there seem to be obstacles between them, like whatever it is, even if it's a wine glass or, or some or a salt shaker, like depending on where you put the camera, that can look like a barrier. Yeah. You know, or, or what's in the background can make make a character look boxed in. Just by the way your camera's situated, you know, there's a wall over here, and there's a clock over here, or whatever, or there's a tree over here, and a, you know, a cloud over here, but it, like, has the effect of boxing in one character, mm -hmm. making one character look less powerful than the other, um, keeping a, a certain character's expression out of frame, or their back is to the camera, or whatever, like, a million ways you can hide their expression, so you're wondering what they're thinking. It's like so many things. It's just it's there's so much. Yeah, yeah. Outside of the, uh, just where the camera's placed, and it's, like especially in a in a comic, even more than a movie, you can sort of play with things. And yeah, you control people's forward. view a lot more in a comic than in any other form of media, even in film. Yeah. Because say in film you've got the camera angle, blah blah blah, but. <sighs> Things are hap more things are happening in um, the frame. In a comic, there's only what everything is absolutely what you choose. Yeah, and it's a still like it's a still yeah. even though things are happening. 
Is time it, is moving. It's artificial, right? So you can sort of create. Everything is created. Yeah, everything, even like the progression of time is like artificial. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Well, I think oh we've. Oh my gosh, sorry. We've yeah. got to about an hour now. Yes, sir. We've talked enough. Talked it out. If that, that's a whole other topic. I, if I knew more about that more sophisticated stuff, I would. Uh, I think you know enough. Fascinating stuff. <laughs> fascinating. Yeah, it's it's fascinating, and I love these the camera angles and shots and things like that. I love doing them. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, wind it up then. So. All right, man. Goodbye from Greece. Tans is uh, just left the room momentarily. So. I'll, um, I'll be right back in a second. We're just saying goodbye. She says goodbye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I am Tanya. You call me Tans, and I say goodbye to you. Bye. <laughs> goodbye to our Greek friends, and goodbye from Newfoundland. <laughs> All right, goodbye everyone, and I'll uh, stop recording. Bye.